All right, we're live. We're live. I got sidetracked, y'all. Greetings and welcome back once again. This is Amuna Yisrael. Solonomics, Love Project, all that lovely, great, awesome, beautiful stuff. Yummy cottage, everything. All things, everything. All praise be to the Creator for another day of life, nice and rested. I said, let me come back before I get my um go on to another topic. Um, so I said. Let me share some of the other things that I had concerning this mammy topic, and then we continue to grow. Why don't we? Now, the other day I played the little different royal thing. They're going to give me a little copyright warning. So I'm going to read. <laughs> I'm going to read unless the, unless the thing is in the collective comments, okay? Um, maybe I played too much of it. Who knows? But um, there's a little documentary of um, Hattie McDaniels. It's on YouTube. I put the link in the box, but I'm going to read the commentary and then I'm going to go on to some of my findings. The discussion is about Mammy. So for those who missed it, uh, last time we spoke about just a general thought of what Mammy is, basically a word for mommy. Mommy, Mammy, Mummy, Mimi in some places, all a term meaning mother, my mother. Now, concerning the melanated body in the institution of slavery, it became something else. Being a mother, having these uh, mothering principles and qualities of nurturing was uh, reappropriated to to nurture, um, rear up, and guide the family of the people who were oppressing you. ALF, what's going on? And so that's what allows this uh, to take a kind of a turn because she would have been in the master's home so she would have been a house servant. She would have been privy to certain goings and comings and information. And then she would have been in a precarious situation. This is a lot of things when we dehumanize, like I said before, our ancestors and, and just look at them in, in many ways in which the stereotype has set them. We forget that they were human in very compromising situations and had to make adaptations in order to just stay alive, right? A lot of people forget that. So anywho, we have... This is in popular media. We have this little documentary here. It's short, but I'm going to read it because it's concerning Hattie McDaniel and how the people of the day, melanated people of the day, weren't too pleased with the part she played in uh, Gone with the Wind. So it says here, Hattie McDaniel's brilliant performances, Mammy, made her the most famous and honored African-American actress of her day. Once again, remember... Once you stereotype, you're going to get famous and honored for playing the stereotypical role. So it was that case in the 30s. It's the case now. But it also put her in, a very, in the very center of the controversy of a racial stereotype in the movies. Patty's big break in motion picture came in 1934 when she was cast in an important role in Judge Priest. The film directed by John Ford was a major success and Hattie was highly praised for her performance. Hattie's success in Judge Priest led to more morals and more money, but she soon found herself being criticized for playing roles that were considered demeaning to the growing civil rights movement. She grew tired of the attacks and responded angrily, when you ask me to not play the parts that have you, what have you got to offer in return? So basically, um, she's being attacked by playing these roles that misrepresenting the people. This is the kind of same with the Lizzo conversation. Nothing new is under the sun. Um, Aunt Esther also got attacked as well when I was doing the study of the angry black woman. The thing is that this Hattie McDaniel or the Mammy space, especially the character that she was playing, it was kind of a crossover overlapping between the angry black woman and the Mammy character. Because she was kind of a sapphire, she was kind of sassy, but at the same time, she was the mammy. So there was a um, there was an overlay of these two characters in her particular mammy role. It says here, um, so she was upset that she was being held accountable. Sounds familiar? She was like, um, she responded angrily when you asked me, talking to her own people, not to play the parts. What have you got to offer in return? The attacks, however, would only grow louder in the following years. And in 1935, George Stevens cast her as the highly independent, this is independent, 
made in Alice Adams opposite Katharine Hepburn. Other roles followed and her back talking, sometimes bossy servant became something of Hattie trademark, although this type of role was a step in the right direction for whom, right? It was a step in the right direction. It surprisingly brought criticism for some white audiences who found Hattie too sassy for their tastes. Again, like I said, it's the let me let me just backtrack a little bit. How I started a lot of this research was researching for the angry black woman syndrome we visited, right? So the angry black, so-called black woman and the independent black woman are the two sides of the same coin. I assert this. This is a moon asserting this. That the angry black woman and the independent, so-called independent black woman is two sides of the same coin, manifesting up differently. And so as this a write-up is saying, Hattie is the working woman, okay? She's making her own coin, but she was also a mammy who has a bit of sapphire in her. So she's a composite, okay? Um, and they go on. But I just kind of want to touch on that because it spoke about how the people of the day saw it as a stereotypical role. They saw it even then, and it was a misrepresentation. Like I said, I had took the liberty to look up... Um, Good evening, Moon. What's going on? I took the liberty to look up how many plantations there were around 18, because now I'm getting into writing more. Once I get into Lev Project, then I'm going to get into writing more. So I'm collecting some data. I took the liberty to look up how many plantations there were in the 1800s before the Civil War. Over 42,000 plantations. Over 42,000. I want to give you the exact number. I think it was like 42.6, right? How many plantations uh, in were there in 1800s, right? So it was about, ooty, this, all this stuff is accessible now. Where did I see it? Plantations in the South. I think it was like 42,000, like 600, something to that effect. Hold on. My point being, on all of these plantations, um, in all of these plantations, no, wait, let me backtrack. Let me backtrack. Where did it go? Let me look on my other thing here, because now I'm going to get all sidetracked with how many plantations there are. But in the meantime, my point is, with all these plantations, well over thousands of plantations, this one, like I said the other day, one stereotypical image of what the mammy or the sometimes cook who doubled as the caretaker and the nanny, this one depiction it, uh, cannot possibly be. Uh, what everyone looked like and what everyone sounded like and how everyone acted like it. Like that just doesn't happen. Okay. So as I was reading today, I did some study on uncle Tom. I was like, I don't remember reading uncle Tom's cabin. So I'm listening to the audio. Let me know how many people want us to listen to it collectively where we just listen to a chapter. Cause it's kind of long. And then we stop and then we listen to a chapter and we stop. Let me know. But anywho, um, I was looking at that Uncle Tom's cabin, and this is, I came across this on little Wikipedia over here, okay, which I found interesting. It says here, how many people have already read Uncle Tom's Cabin? Let me know. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin or Life Among the Lowly. The book, I'm going to jump down, this is a Wikipedia article. The book and the plays it inspired helped popularize a number of stereotypes about black people. Keep in mind, I talk about stereotypes and the study that I did on stereotypes and how stereotypes come into popular culture. Okay. I talked about that a lot, a lot, a lot of times. So it's saying this book that was published in 1852, remember slavery is still doing its thing, but the civil war is making its way on in. Okay. It says, these include the affectionate dark-skinned mammy, the piccaninny stereotype of black children, and the Uncle Tom, or dutiful, long-suffering servant faithful to his white master or mistress. So this book, which in its first year, when it was published, 
was um, sold over 300,000 copies. I mean, that's an accomplishment in today's space and time. You know, I think it's like 50,000 or something to be on the New York Times bestseller of something of that effect. Um, certainly not 300,000. So Uncle Tom's Cabin sells over 300,000 times in the first year. And during the 19th century, I believe they said that it was the second best-selling book next to the Bible. So understand that this stereotype, this one image, this thought was impressed in the minds of the people that this is what a mammy is, based on Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, description of what would have been that particular um, mammy or mommy or melanated woman in the house. And because it was read and circulated so many times and something that would be in the minds of the people, this is what became the standard for many people of what a mammy was. Now, according to what I am reading and what I'm researching, she goes into another book. I think it's the keys of Uncle Tom's Cabin, where she says that a lot of this information was based on um, factual, you know, narratives, slave narratives. Um, but there's no way that we, the people can think that all quote unquote mammies look just like this. And, and of course I went over the other day, what some of them actually look like. So let's go for it. Let's go for it. I'm going to share my screen now, y'all. Hold on a second. You down for that? All right. I think I'm going to do, it's a lot. It's like, it's a lot. It's a long book. Um, apparently she started to publish it back in that time. She had published it weekly and then it took us, but so what we could do is I'll play the audio and then we would, um, we would discuss each chapter like that. Like I'll play the audio. It's a lever box production. So that should be in the collective comments so that they wouldn't, you know, come for me or nothing. And then I'll just play the audio and then we'll discuss and we kind of do it like that. I mean, so far, you know what I mean? I, of course, I went ahead because I'm like, what's going on here? But very, I mean, so many nuggets to pull out of this. So many nuggets. But anyway, let me share my screen real quick. So we could ease on down this road. Some of the popular, um, some of the popular mammy figures now that are still being circulated. Remember, I said Hattie McDonald's character became this composite of the sapphire, the, the angry black woman, the mammy. And so we have this brother here, Tyler Perry, who has made a whole empire, an entire empire on the stereotypical mammy image. I think I looked up one time how much his movies grossed in totality. And I don't even want to lie on the brother. Hold on. Ooh, and how this image, like Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, was broadcasted around the world. How many to reinforce this stereotype? So it's not like Harriet Beecher Stowe. How much did Tyler Perry movies? gross. It's not like um, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote this like 150 years ago and it went away. No. She, he keeps reinforcing this stereotype, made millions and millions of dollars off this stereotype. And um, yeah. And there you go. What? Are they hating on the kid? Ain't nobody going through off the, off the thing. Here. Highest paid man in entertainment earning $130 million U.S. between May. This is May, okay? Net worth $600 million. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but I think I did look it up one time, the, the franchise. Hold on, let's see the, the numbers. Here we go. Let's look at the numbers. They like to say, well, what's the numbers? Let's look at the numbers. Do, 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 do. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I did. I saw this one time. Okay, starting since two thousand and five to two thousand and nineteen, where a lot of his movies have to do with stereotypical angry black women, independent black women, um, mammy black women. Um, a lot of the 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 movies have to do with that. So it, it shows you to production budget. It shows you opening weekend, box office domestic, box office worldwide. 
okay? Worldwide box office. It's very important because this image is projected to the entire world. And so when they see you, they see this. So worldwide box office is at 62 million. No, I'm, I'm lying. 62 billion. One, one, two, three. No. Yeah, that's million. And 61 million. 61.7. And then it shows you opening. And this is collectively. And then it gives you the total. Close to $600 million. This is why they value him at this. Okay? And this is all in projecting this negative, as some will have it, stereotype. Very, 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 very interesting. They have this little... um. And who's supporting it? Who's pushing it? Who's paying for it? Who's celebrating it? Who's sharing it? Who's indulging in it? All of the questions. All right. That was just a little fun exercise. This is another brother here. It didn't get to the Tyler Perry status, but he also, um, Martin Lawrence. This is another, since we're talking about Mammy, this is another... Um, big quote, black quote, uh, um, you know, the look of what a mammy as they're describing would be. And he's another one who made a series of movies on big mama's house. It could have easily been called big mammy's house. I'm just saying. So now let's go to some of the things that have been, uh, written. This is one of them I'm going to put in the box. As you, this is a this is a a dissertation from 1976 from for Ohio State University. The person who wrote it was Karen Sue Warren Jewell back in 1976. This is before I was born personally. This is an analysis of the visual development of a stereotype. The the media's portrayal of Mammy and Aunt Jemima as symbols of black womanhood. How interesting. This is before, you know what I mean? This is before Tyler Perry becomes, what he, when did, was he born now? This was a concern then. This is over 43 years ago, 40, almost 44 years ago. Let's see how old he was when this woman wrote this. He was born in 1969. And this uh, dissertation was in 76. So this is seven years. He's seven years old when this dissertation is being written. An analysis of the visual development of a stereotype. Visual. We just seen somebody who made over $600 million in visually reinforcing a stereotype. The media's portrayal of, portrayal of Mammy and Aunt Jemima as symbols of black womanhood. Not only just the media. He's the media, all right. And he's a melanated brother. Okay, so I'm going to jump down here. So this is her dissertation for her doctorate. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. They go through all of that. And I'm just going to jump down a little bit. This is some of the stuff she covers. If you want to read it for yourself, America's conception of beauty and Mammy and the antithesis. Mammy is primarily responsible for rearing white children and serving as lifelong com companion. The fashioning of handkerchiefs into scars to be worn on the head can be traced back to Africa. Mammy's portrayed by the media failed to resemble this real life Mammy. And it goes on. You can definitely take a look, but I just wanted to read a few things and I'll drop the link in the box as always. Oh, hold on. Let's just do a little introduction to her thoughts, shall we? Chapter one, purpose. The purpose of this study is to explore the mass media's depiction of portrayal of Mammy and Aunt Jemima. In order to determine the media's systematic utilization of these images as symbols of both black womanhood, Specifically, the mass media in the United States has historically defined the features possessed by Mammy and Aunt Jemima negatively. In addition to attributing negative and unpalatable unpal connotations to the characteristics which the media ascribes to Mammy and Aunt Jemima, attempts both of a subtle and overt nature have been made to assign these same negative traits or features to Black women in America through a process of generalization. 
as a consequence of the successfulness of the media's efforts, uh, Black women in America are perceived and responded to on the basis of the mythological and stereotypical imagery. Yes, this is what is happening. Has been happening. They saw you on TV. They think you're going to react the way Shanene, which was also another melanated male, which is Martin Lawrence, used to act. Or they think they're going to act, you're going to act like Wanda, um, another melanated male, Jamie Foxx's character of A Living Color is going to act. Or they think they're going to act like um, uh, Esther Rolls' character. These are all of the perceived ways that they already think you're going to act based on what the media is showing, and also based on, in truth, based on what many actors now for the last hundred plus years have been willing to portray, like Hattie Dalian said, for that, for that coin. Because unless you got some coin for her, like the Lizzo conversation, then don't tell her what to do. The rationale for media's portrayal of Mammy and Aunt Jemima from this perspective is deeply embedded in the very fabric of American society and date back to early conceptions of the value or the worth of black women as human beings. And it's funny how melanated males, the value of the melanated woman, the male is women willing to mock, mimic, and make a mockery of her on film for economic gain. Yeah. When you look at the ratio of how many female comedians are willing to dress up as the male counterpart to make an entire, let's say, $600 million empire, I'll wait while you find the person. (laughs) But we have our male counterparts who are willing to dress up as females and to further this stereotypical imagery of her. So it's just, hmm. and let's see, let's see, let's see. Further, there has been an attempt on the part of many white Americans, both male and female, to conceal the treatment which they have afforded the black woman during and subsequent to slavery. There are numerous evidences of physical and sexual abuses perpetrated against black women in America, most of which have historically been denied or de-emphasized. The media has served to corroborate the stories of the perpetrators of these wrong films by depicting black women through the images of Mammy and Aunt Jemima as lacking femininity, beauty, attractiveness, or integral characteristics generally associated with womanhood. I just made a mention of the. Hold on one second. Let me know if you guys are still there. So, um, because sometimes we need, I don't know the new stuff because I, you know, I'm a little dated. But y'all get the point. So who remember this? What did she, what was she just talking about? The media's portrayal of what the melanated woman is, looks like. So this was back in the 90s. So the portrayal of, oh, she's ugly, she's this, she's that. And this is Jamie Foxx, another melanated man, who's willing to project this image. To the world. We also have, um, and what was her name? We have this one, which is the Shanene image. Uh huh. Let's keep going here. In addition, these images suggest satisfaction and or contentment with the status position which they occupy, usually domestic, thereby implying that black women in this country are completely satisfied with this level of achievement. Consequently, the message which resounds clearly is black women are not worthy of the special considerations afforded women of other races since their physical and emotional makeup vitiates such treatment. There are ostensible discrepancies in the media's depiction of the Mammy and Aunt Jemima vis-a-vis individuals who occupy this status in real life. The media's conceptualization and portrayal of these images reflects an erroneous conceptualization and distorted perspective. In real life, Mammies perform 
many diverse functions and engaged in numerous constructive endeavors geared towards the amelioration of the plight of their families and their race. In addition, mammies have also been viable forces within the American or white society. They successfully socialize white children, thereby producing businessmen, doctors, lawyers, and other professionals. The images of Mammy and Aunt Jemima, although portrayed negatively by the mass media, possess positive attributes which can be generalized to many Black women in America. For example, the Black woman is recognized in the Black community for her continuous efforts to sustain the Black race and its many viable institutions. She performs instrumental and effective functions in the home. And this was 1976. So in this present day, people may argue that even in this 40 year time span, many things have changed, right? Or as well as many things remain the same. In addition to assuming these dual functions, she has the primary responsibility of socializing her children to function successfully in two cultural systems, American black society and the American white social system. As I was reading another uh, character came to mind which was um what's ha- who remember what's happening what's happening and his mother was if i'm not mistaken his mother was a maid there she goes and where was his mother there she goes she was overweight and she was single mother. There she goes right there. Let me see if I get a better picture. Who remembers what's happening now? There she goes. She was overweight and she was a single mother. And she, you know, Raj was always trying to get around her. And D was the tattletale. And you had this stereotypical image of the mammy um, working, as she's saying in this paper, on both fronts, rearing or attending to outside help and as well as trying to hold her household together all while not necessarily having the infrastructure to do it efficiently. It says Staples 1970s deed discusses the formidable task confronting the black mother in the rearing of black children in a white society. She asserts that the black mother must provide material and emotional support to her children and must also encourage them to learn the educational and job skills necessary for success in this world. However, the cards are stacked against her, making the black mother's task a most difficult one. He further states that although these obstacles exist, black mothers for generations have effectively reared their children. And a lot of people in this day and time may want to contest, but we can go on. Let me see. I'm going to go on for, because I just want to touch a little bit on another book. Do-do-do. Hold on, her introduction going really long here. What's going on here? Okay, for the sake of time. I thought my introduction. The introduction is type long. So you could take a look with it. Hello. Hold on, y'all. Let me see. Let me read a little more. It is unfortunate that the media fails to convey this image to its large audiences. You do see one of the ways where the tide was changing in the positive conveyor of um, the melanated woman, not necessarily as a mammy, was uh, this show. Because we have this show that had to do with, you know, possible portrayal of the mammy. We have, and I was going back and forth on this, but we do have the Jeffersons, where some would argue that Louise, uh -uh, some would argue that Louise, and y'all tell me if Louise fits the mammy role. Because when I was doing the research about the angry black woman, then one would say that Florence fits that angry black woman role because she's sassy, she's the sapphire, this, that, and the third. But Louise is the more, um, she's the, she's the one who's the supportive one. And although George didn't necessarily have her going out, she could have still fit in that, mm, as they were saying, mammy role. 
But when we got to shows like, um, and we're talking about mass media, that's why I'm bringing up these media roles. When we got to shows like the Cosby show, we saw a turn. We saw the mother represented differently in the show. Oopsie. Right? Which is Claire Huxtable's character. She was uh, working. She also was supportive within her household, within the structure, in conjunction with her husband. So it wasn't the single mother struggling. It was able-bodied people. It was a strong relationship that um, came together to rear their children, which really turned, took things in a different direction as it related to what people were seeing. And this is why, you know, for me, and many, the Cosby show represented something totally different. It wasn't about struggling. It wasn't about being in the ghetto. It wasn't, you know, about all, all of those things. It gave us a different, um, it gave us a different outlook. But let me continue here because I have something else to touch on real quickly. She's saying, it's unfortunate that media fails to convey this image to its large audiences. And again, this is 1976. Cosby show doesn't come on till the 80s. According to Staples, the usual cultural image of the black woman in America is that of a domineering type who rules the family, her husband included. She's seen as a masculine female who must be subordinated in order that the black male may take his rightful place in society. Further, this image of her as conveyed through mass media is accepted by white people. Sociological studies find that the matriarchal structure of the black family, a primary deterrent to black progress. One can only wonder how victims of a dual oppression have acquired such an image. And she's giving a quote, but where does the quote start? I only see the end quote. I don't see the beginning quote. But yeah, so, oh no, the quote starts all the way up here. Starts at the usual cultural image. So it, it, with intention, if I'm getting correct, what the author is saying, that there is an intentional effort to paint uh, the melanated woman to reinforce this stereotype of this uh, specific uh, characteristic within certain melanated women so that the home environment will continue to be off kilter and thereby them not stabilizing themselves and being able to join together as a unit. So it's advantageous to continue to support and push to the forefront these types of personalities, you know, single ladies, put your hands up all the while you got your dude in the back. Like how you singing single lady songs and to the left, to the left, and you over there holding on to your dude. You know what I'm saying? It was really good. <laughs> so <laughs> like, you know, very interesting stuff. American society, primarily the media fails to give accolades to the mammies and Aunt Jemima's who have aided in the development and maintenance of white social systems. As stated earlier, it is the skill, knowledge, and phenomenal cap capabilities of the Mammies and Aunt Jemimas, which resulted in the production of Southern Bell, the Southern Gentlemen, Presidents of the United States, and numerous other successful individuals, both black and white, both male and female. It is unfortunate that the media and American society have chosen to repay or remunerate Mammy and Aunt Jemima who represent untold numbers of black women for their efforts by relegating them to such levels of insignificance, capable only of generating laughter, selling foodstuffs, and representing anomalies relative to womanhood, femininity, and beauty. In addition, the numerous mammies and Aunt Jemimas that simultaneously socialize their own biological children, as well as their masters or their employer's offspring, did so effectively in both instances. If you remember... Um, if, and you can go on and read, but if you remember uh, in the the, the uh, different world episode, and they're like, there is something to be proud of, and they're like, I don't see myself in that person because remember when Kimberly like throws it over, like she doesn't see herself, and so the author in this paper is saying, hey, are you forgetting the role that she was playing? Why? How did you boil her down? How do you condense her down? To this, something that you should be ashamed of, and you're not you're not remembering that it was on her knee, it was at her breast that all of these great people who you do respect and you do reverence came up. But I don't think that's only just a situation or an issue as it relates to mammies. That's oftentimes the mother itself, and you can see that represented in today's society. If you're a stay-at-home mother, I mean, people be like, "Well, do you have a job?" And you'd be like. Yeah, I'm a stay-at-home mother, and they and they like, like, do you have a job? So that job 
um, <laughs> in society itself is not really respected. It's, it's, it's just basically expected that this is what you should do. And oftentimes without compensation. And, but you only really notice if you do a bad job. <laughs> you know what I mean? But anyway, so you, I'm going to put this in the box. I'm going to put that in the box and then I'm going to go over this. Let me take a one second, drink a little water. Check on everybody. Put this in the box. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you doing? This is the this is the file here for the um for the dissertation I was reading from. Very, very interesting stuff. Very, very interesting. And she wrote this for her doctorate. So this is she did the study on the mammy. The last thing I wanted to touch on, and for many, you know, sometimes I, I, I touch on spaces that are going to add more information to the discussion so that we are not just black or white on a lot of things. Like the points that she's bringing up, who's remembering that these are the people who sacrificed oftentimes themselves so that other people could live and other people could run off and become whatever they were. These are the people who put themselves in between you and the oppressor, who put themselves between you and someone else so that you may have a chance. You know what I mean? And just to look at it and, and characterize it as just what we feel now, again, that's no not respecting the elders who came before you. I talked about that on the discussion uh before when I was talking about um, ADOS and FBA and this discussion of the elders who came before you, not respecting the elders for the contribution that they've made, just because we may not understand it or because we're at a different position than they are, they were, and we feel as though we can judge rightfully, not understanding what are the tools that they were working with. Something to think about. Speaking of Aunt Jemima, so I put that in the box so you can read that at your leisure. Speaking of Aunt Jemima, this book is called Clinging to Mammy. And I just want to read a little bit from it. Let me see here. There. Clinging to Mammy. Y'all already know it's in my Amazon box. But we're going to read a little few free pages off of Google, um, Google Books. If you're not up on Google Books, it's Clinging to Mammy, the Faithful Slave in 20th Century America. Okay. This was written in 2007. And some of the things that you will find in this book, The Life of Aunt Jemima, Anxious Performances, The Line Between Mother and Mammy, Monumental Power, The Violence of Affection, Confronting the Mammy Problem. Yeah, I gotta cop this book. It looks also interesting. Introduction, The Faithful Slave. When newspapers reported her death in 1923, many obituaries sounded a common refrain summed up by a headline in the Missouri Farmer, Missouri Farmer. Aunt Jemima is gone. Americans had first fallen in love with, a, with the ex-slave cook and her secret recipe for pancakes at the Wells Columbian Exposition in Chicago in the summer and fall of 1893. By all accounts, her debut there had been glorious. Fairgoers were drawn to the giant barrel-shaped concession of R.T. Davis Milling Company by the smell of buttery hot cakes and the sounds of laughter and applause. Rise above the general roar of thousands of people moving through the agricultural building, a single voice called to them with a southern cadence, reminiscent of the old days. It was the voice of an old black woman they would soon come to know as Aunt Jemima. As she slid steaming pancakes onto platters, where we are. The woman described her days as a slave, winking and grinning at the audience she held in thrall. And Jemima told of happy times 
pause side past on beautiful plantation of endless parties and parades of house guests for whom she cooked bountiful stacks of her delicious pancakes which were famous throughout the south oh how they loved those hot cakes and now thanks to davis milling company people all over the country could have pancakes made from aunt jemima's secret recipe all you had to do was add water to the mix she explained no need to measure or have eggs and milk on hand, just a little water and a hot griddle for perfect pancakes every time. They were so easy to make and so delicious, it was as if Aunt Jemima herself was in your kitchen making them for you. People in a dense crowd at the exhibition stand crushed forward to get a better glimpse of the woman who had been a slave and to sample her pancakes. Aunt Jemima kept the spirituals, work songs, stories coming with she, while she flipped hot cakes, pouring fresh Disc of batter and filled plates for her hungry audience. They were hungry for the food, hungry for grand plantation abundance and refined southern hospitality, but most of all, they were hungry for her. That was an interesting scene, wasn't you there? You felt like you was up there in the in the joint watching her do the thing. That was that was an excellent opening right there, brother. The elderly woman whose death was reported in 1923 was not Aunt Jemima. No such person actually existed marketing. The woman who was struck by a car and killed, who for 30 years had held the job of acting the role of Aunt Jemima, was Nancy Green. While Aunt Jemima was dubbed the most famous colored woman in the world, end quote, after the Columbian Exposition, Nancy Green's life was obscured by the trademark figure she portrayed and by the faithful sl slave image she embodied. Green, born in slavery in Kentucky, had made her way north to Chicago where she worked as a domestic servant like so many other African-American women before and after her. Oh, let me drink a little water here. Someone visiting her employer's home believed that she might satisfy R.T. Davis's search for a black woman to demonstrate his new product. <laughs> Boy, perhaps it was her skill, her convenient location in Chicago, a force of personality, or all these attributes that suggested her suitability to portray Aunt Jemima. What is clear is that Green did not come to Chicago at the behest of a milling concern, nor had he arrived with a secret recipe for terrific pancakes, and no one had ever called her Aunt Jemima before. Vivid accounts of her debut at the fair had been told over and over, yet they all ultimately traced back to advertisements and promotional materials produced after the event, not to eyewitnesses and not to Green herself. Marketing bill. Mm -mm -mm. Nancy Green's experience of working at the exposition was transformed through ads and a pseudo-slave narrative produced by the R.T. Davis Company into an event in the commercially constructed life of Aunt Jemima. And when the real Nancy Green was accidentally killed, her popular eulogy became... Aunt Jemima is gone. But in 1923, Aunt Jemima was not gone. Both the trademark and the popular figure of the slave mammy outlived Nancy Green. Stories and images of slaves as faithful and loving, dependent of which the mammy has been the most popular representation, drenched American culture and politics throughout the 20th century and persists to this day. Whew! So they don't lie. They don't lie about Aunt Jemima. For marketing and money gain, ain't nothing changed. Ain't nothing changed. Hmm. Let's see here. Another popular variation is Scarlett O'Hara's feisty but adoring loyal mammy in the film Gone with the Wind. As she played, was played by Hattie McDaniel, the fictional character whose only name was her descriptor, Mammy, remains dear to the hearts and plantation fantasies of many. Yet Aunt Jemima, her smile beaming still from store shelves, freezer sections, and kitchen covers, is the most enduring image of the faithful slave. The drama of Nancy Green's life eclipsed by the mammy figure has been played again and again in the experience of black women in the United States. The myth of the faithful slave lingers because of many white Americans have wished to live in a world in which African Americans are not angry over past, present, and present injustices. A world in which white people were and are not complicit 
in which the injustices themselves of slavery, Jim Crow, and ongoing structural racism seem not to exist at all. The Mammy Finger affirmed this, their wishes. The narrative of faithful slave is deeply rooted in the American racial imagination. It is a story of our national past and political future that blurs the lines between myth and memory, guilt and justice, stereotype and individuality, commodity and humanity. Mammies, as they have been described. Wait, hold on. Let's go ahead and look at the mammy that never existed. Hold on. <laughs> hold on, y'all. Mm -mm 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 -mm. See, they took her headscarf off. This is what she was looking like. And then they took her headscarf off. Let's see here. They made her face a little younger. There it go. Mm -mm, mm -mm -mm. They lightened her up, took her headscarf off, and made her a little younger, made her lose a little bit of weight. Mm, mm, mm. Marketing. What this one say here? Law C folks show chair for fluffy energizing. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me get back to uh reading here. All right, we learning, y'all. Mm-hmm. Mammies, as they have been described and remembered by whites, like all faithful slaves, bear little resemblance to actually enslaved women of the antebellum period. Black women did work in white homes, cooked innumerable meals, cared for white children, and surely formed emotional ties to white family members at times. But the mammy was and is a fiction. She's the most visible character in the myth of the faithful slave. And we just read about where now she becomes fictionalized. She, the mammy is based on a reality, but the exaggerated characteristics of the mammy is based on fictionalized versions, which would be the stereotype. Because we just said there's no way that you just had one type of person for like all of those plantations that you had. There's no way. She's the most visible character in the midst of the faithful slave. A set of stories, images, and ideas that have been passed down from generation to generation in the United States through every possible popular medium from fine art and literature to the vaudeville stage and cinema and countless novelty items from ashtrays to salt and pepper shakers. These narratives are locked emotionally and politically to the slave narrative genre. Early versions produced in the antebellum period by pro-slavery white Southerners were explicitly reactionary. The stories are designed to provide reassurance that their author, patriarchal benevolence, was real and was recognized and appreciated by those enslaved. They were hurled northwards in response to the publication of slave narratives detailing the horror and humanity of institution, the speaking tours by activists, runaways, and the impact of abolitionist work such as Uncle Tom's Cabin, a personally sad, and that's what we're going to be listening to, as personally satisfied as they were politically and economically, potent tales of faithful slavery appears with greater frequency. So just to talk a little bit about that, there was a whole atmosphere that we tend to, well, they don't really teach us in school that was really happening and that was a kind of a call and response as the author is saying that when in the early 1800s when the abolitionist movement began to gain steam right through papers and tours and a lot of the narratives that were written during that time the north of a lot of the north although they were complicit with slavery a lot of the people in the north did not know the gruesome details, the day-to-day -day life of what was happening in the South. So when a lot of them were seeing or hearing what was happening or reading, they began to, some began to come, become outraged. 
And in a way, the South decided to combat this, that they would start these minstrel shows. Um, they would start these shows to show, what are you talking about? You know, they're happy here, see? And they would be all European men, because um, women at that time wasn't allowed to go on stage. And they would play all of these characters with these exaggerated um, behaviors and they would play the happy slave and they would play, you know, all of these things to see. So it was like propaganda, counter propaganda, so that um, they can get their quote perspective out. And I've come across some of those books that it was a propaganda piece. And you're like, what? You know, you, you know, yeah, I was tripping. But anyway, the Mammy narrative embodied in the Aunt Jemima trademark dates back at least to the 1830s when members of the planter class began using these stories to animate their assertions of slavery as benevolent and slave owning as honorable. When my mother arrived in Charleston, she sought out a faithful slave, I mean servant, as a nurse for her young family. Margaret was her name, which we soon contracted into endearing appellative of Mammy Margaret. A South Carolina gentleman explains to his visitor from New York in a serial installment titled Diary of an Invalid in the Southern Literature Messenger in 1836. She was the most devoted and faithful servant I ever knew. I loved and venerated her next to my mother. The account framed as the diary of the consumptive New Yorker who travels the globe seeking cures for all ailments, more amenable climates and stories from the locals shows that the popular Miami narrative was already well established by this time. Upon this arrival at the Grand Charles home of Colonel H.B. Ashton, the, what is that? One narrator is bewitched by the portrait of a young woman that hangs in the parlor. He learns that she is the Colonel's cousin who was driven mad and died young and unspoiled, quote unquote, in the midst of the Revolutionary War, when she learned in a single afternoon of the death of both her naval officer father and her soldier fiance. While it is her story that drives the narrative, it is the affection and attention of Mammy Margaret that makes the young woman's character apparent and illuminates her love for these two men. With her last dying breath, fevered, hallucinating, she calls to her enslaver caretaker, Mammy Margaret, bring my bridal dress. The procession is waiting for me to the church, you know. We must go to be united. There is Alfred and Father too. Haste, haste. And then, and then they continue. They continue, they continue, they continue. Um, so definitely, I'm going to drop this one in the box. It's, this book is also available on Amazon. And again, it just helps us to put into context this mammy conversation. And I know for some, it's like, oh, she's going too far in. But why not? If we can run out of gums about what we feel or what we think or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Then we can bring facts into the discussion and not just be confined to, oh, you know, one way of looking at it when the, the topic is way more expansive. So in closing, I would say that this is an interesting topic that's com connected to many other topics and gaining clarity on the fact that mammy is mommy is mummy is a mother figure who is already in a role that is not respected often in a patriarchal dominated society as was this system of which slavery was under, especially for the servant class. It was something that was expected of you. Your labor was extracted, your everything, your energy, everything. And the acknowledgement oftentimes of what you were able to do over a long period of time was not necessarily something that many people uh, on both sides were willing to uh, give you credit for. And because she, in some places, had to become this, she had to become this, um, this very protective figure over over the oppressor side 
because she had to look like she was doing her job. <laughs> you know what I mean? She's put in this position. She has to look like she cares. That's her job. That's her bread and butter. That's how her real family on the other side eats. So it's very, it's, man, it's a very compromising situation to be in. It's not like the field hand who, you know, can express disdain for the for the slave master or for the slave, the mistress, and she doesn't have to see her. It's not like that. You have to see the person. The person is calling you. The person is making requests of you. You're in close proximity to the person. A good ex- illustration of, of, of living in the big house is the series um, Underground. If you remember that series Underground that came on a few years ago, and you, Ernestine was her name, and she was in the big house. If you look at what a lot of the women and men who were actually living in the quarters, what they had to, the pressures that they were under on the continuum, you will kind of kind of look at this conversation just a little bit differently. Just a little bit differently. So I give two reading assignments, if you feel. The dissertation is up there. And the name of the next book is Clinging to Mammy. Let me, let me see if I get it on Amazon. And then we just found out that they just made up Aunt Jemima. Well, there you go. They made up Aunt Jemima. It was all a... It was all a... Um, what you call it? It was all a marketing scheme. Clinging, cling, clinging to mammy. Here we go. Boom. By Mickey McElia. Here's the name of the book. The Faithful Slave in the 20th Century. So it looks like a good read, y'all. It looks like a good read. So with that, anybody have any questions or comments? I just wanted to bring some of that information. It's a lot. I'm not going to, the dissertation, like 170 some pages. So I'm not going to read all of that. And the clinging to Mary is just an introduction, just giving us a, a little taste, just wetting our beak, wetting our palate just a little bit um, about this conversation so we can elevate it. Because you know, when we elevate it is when we can see it for what it is, not be so reactionary and be able to even speak to um, on another level and prayerfully reach, you know, I may be optimistic, but prayerfully reach people in another level besides using the stereotypes in the way in which they were designed to be used. So just like it said in the Different World episode, deactivating, basically I said deactivating the children, but reappropriating the stereotype. If we hurl these stereotypes, mammy, and you just hurl it at the person, oh, Lizzo, you're acting like a mammy then we're just using the stereotypes in the way in which they were meant to be used. So the intention is I'm going to show you in an ugly manner, and then somebody is uh, acting in that manner, so I'm going to throw the label on them, and then that just makes the person upset, it triggers them, and then nothing happens. But if you elevate the conversation and have an understanding of how you got to that place, then even though you may draw the... um, draw the parallel between the person's behavior and how they program you to act, then you can, you can, you can give more information for them to be able to um, possibly pull themselves out of that space that they may find themselves in. If you can understand what I'm saying, there's more to think about. There's no, it's, it's more, it's more to the story. And then they can find the strength is what they need to elevate themselves. A lot of times they were doing it for money. Hannah McDaniel said she did it for money. Um, uh, Aunt Esther's character was like, you know, they out here working. And the, the thing is, if you don't have anything for me, else for me to do, then why are you talking to me? If you're not going to help me get this bag or you don't have any other options, then why are you talking to me? <laughs> you know, and that's, that's kind of the position that they take and not realizing that you help, you hurt a lot of people in the end, but in the interim, that's the position that they decide to take. So with that said, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm going to go continue to what, listen to the recording and then we're going to come in, you know, at another time, we're just going to have to break it up and listen to uncle Tom's cabin together and, you know, learn and grow. So with that, everybody, thanks for tuning in and everybody have a blessed night.